tonight, a riot at the Alice Springs Correction Centre leaves dorms destroyed and three people in hospital. Health concerns over dust from a Northern Territory manganese mine. Olympic dreams dashed as an ACL injury sidelines Sam Kerr for the season. And our Golden Girls, the Aussies, win big at the Globes. Good evening, Melissa McKay with ABC News. Two dormitories at the Alice Springs prison have been destroyed and two inmates hospitalised after a riot overnight. Corrections say the situation is now under control, but the union is calling for urgent action to prevent further unrest. Charmaine Allison reports. Chaos at the Alice Springs Correctional Centre. We're really concerned that this is just one of the first riots going to be for um, Alice Springs. The union says late last night, a group of 27 inmates used bed frames to break down their dorm room doors, setting their beds on fire and breaking apart pedestal fans to attack officers. We believe that the reason that these riots were done was just to, was just to cause havoc and to cause um, damage. Pepper spray needed to bring the riot under control, with two inmates and an officer transported to hospital with minor injuries. The incident comes just two weeks after a group of prisoners attempted a prison break at G Block, where the rioting occurred. I've asked for assistance from the Department of Infrastructure, Planning and Logistics to commission an immediate security review of G Block and its infrastructure. Uh, to understand whether there are any other vulnerabilities that we need to address as a matter of priority and we're working on that now. The union says G Block has long been waiting for the NT government to repair damage from previous riots, but little has been done. Officers have also been desperately calling for air conditioning to be installed at the prison, with fears extreme heat is only worsening the unrest. We just want time frames because we don't want any position where an officer is killed or a prisoner is killed. In Darwin, there are 1,439 inmates, 391 more than design capacity. While in Alice Springs, there are 680, 204 more than design capacity. The government promises it's acting. There is a modular facility going in there that will provide an additional 96 beds uh, for Alice Springs. So, um, and the same in Darwin. So it is about extending and enlarging that facility. A welcome addition, but still not enough. Charmaine Allison, ABC News, Alice Springs. The Northern Territory government has been accused of prioritising the economy over Indigenous health after concerns were raised about the effects of a manganese mine on a remote NT island. Former Chief Minister Natasha Files resigned late last year after it was revealed she held undisclosed shares in the company which operates the mine. On remote Groot Island off Arnhem Land, communities have long lived alongside manganese dust from South 32's Gemco mine. Three years ago, teacher Jeff Ashman discovered the island's Indigenous Land Council had carried out manganese exposure testing. It found concerningly high levels of manganese in residents' nails and hair. The World Health Organization warns breathing in even low levels of manganese causes respiratory and brain function damage. We have to take this seriously and we're not going to take it seriously unless we get out there and establish an assessment. Natasha Files resigned as Chief Minister last month after admitting she had refused to investigate the dust concerns while holding shares in South 32. It is clear that I have failed to meet the standards that are set for us. The company has told the ABC there have only been limited times it succeeded mine dust guidelines and not since 2022. The Land Council stopped its testing, saying manganese in people could be naturally occurring from soil or water. But Jeff Ashman has written to the reshuffled government with another appeal. For an urgent assessment 
the, of the health and well-being of the Aboriginal people uh, on Groot Island. Asked if it will do that, the NT government responded that the mine has a dust mitigation strategy and at this time no further actions are required. It's considering whether any research into potential health impacts is needed in the future. That mine has been there for a very long time on Groot Island, has been there for, what, 40, 50 years. Um, but we do also want Territorians to be safe and healthy. The Gemco mine is one of the NT's few major businesses. The CLP opposition won't commit to health testing either. What we need to do to restore certainty to Territorians is review that decision made by the former Chief Minister. Jeff Ashman is worried both parties may care more about the politics than the people. The problems to a degree are known, so we really want action. Jane Barden, ABC News. Northern Territory mango growers have seen some sweet relief following a tough season, with the NT reporting the highest mango production in Australia for 2023. An unseasonably hot year across Northern Australia saw crops in the Territory fall by 22% on the year prior, but the NT government says the Territory still managed to produce the most mangoes of any jurisdiction, with 51% of Australia's total production. Territory scientists are also currently working on ways to combat the expected rising impact of climate change on future mango crops. Towns in central Victoria are facing an anxious wait after record levels of rain battered communities overnight, leaving them bracing for the possibility of another devastating flood in just over a year. Wet weather has inundated large swathes of the state, with some places recording three months of rain in just 24 hours. The State Emergency Service has responded to 1,200 requests for help, including dozens of rescues for people who have driven through flood water. Just 15 months after floods devastated central Victoria, this is what communities feared the most. It's now too late to leave Ye, where floodwaters are lapping at the leaves of trees. At Gornong, northeast of Bendigo, the Ferguson Bridge, which sits over the Campaspe River, is completely submerged, a torrent now obscuring the town sign, leaving livestock seeking higher ground and residents knee-deep in water as they survey the damage. It was higher than every other flood I've ever seen. Yeah, the last one was pretty high, but this was worse. It's like there's no outlet down there. In the past 24 hours, unprecedented levels of rain has deluged central Victoria. 117 millimetres at Reedsdale and 184 millimetres was recorded at Heathcote. Water's risen here, risen to, in front of where our shop here is on High Street, uh, it would have been at least a metre deep. I'll give you some information. It's not great news, unfortunately. Tomorrow, Rochester is in the firing line. Major flooding there is possible after the town received 126 millimetres of rain. Lee Wilson's mother, Lorraine, is still living in her caravan while recovering from last year's floods, which damaged her home. For hundreds of homes still in Rochester are gutted and haven't been repaired from the uh, 2022 flood. Um, and so for those people, uh, I can only imagine it's a sheer level of, uh, of uh, either desperation or, or devastation. But there's also been frustration. Since Sunday, the State Emergency Service has received more than 1,200 calls for help, including 38 rescues. And in the majority of cases, it's people taking their lives in their own hands and attempting to drive through flash flood waters. Cars don't float for very long and they end up causing serious risk to people in them and can potentially cause uh, loss of life. So please listen to the warnings and don't drive through flood water. Staying safe and alert. Mike Lorigan, ABC News, Seymour. Now, the battle lines have been drawn over the future of summer nats in Canberra after a senior police officer went on the attack over the event and those who attended it. The four-day annual car festival was marred by an ugly brawl between patrons and apparent crowd control staff. The footage has gone viral on social media. It prompted the ACT's senior road traffic police officer to brand the event more on tourism and question the intelligence of some attendees. Ethan French reports. It's an event loved by petrol heads, but there's clearly no love lost between police and some of the attendees. 
the behaviour of these drivers, I mean, they just haven't evolved very far. I think they've really plateaued as a <laughs> as a, a species, a subspecies of the human race. I don't know what goes through their mind. The four-day Summer Nats Festival draws 130,000 people to Canberra every year. But after some of the behaviour over the weekend, not all will be welcomed back. The, the real car enthusiasts are not the problem. It's the, the, the moron tourism that we get. I mean, if we set up an IQ testing station at the border instead of a vehicle testing station, we'd probably halve our problems. Police are investigating this vicious fight, which marred Saturday and has since spread across social media. We'll continue to work professionally and respond professionally to those sort of outbreaks. Um, we're also working closely with the event organisers and security. It takes an extra 100 officers a day to police the festival, leaving the force stretched to the limit, managing the often rowdy influx. They were all over Canberra and we're literally just going around playing whack-a-mole. Police say two children and two adults were in this vehicle, caught doing an illegal burnout outside the official venue and just metres from pedestrians. The 22-year-old local driver, one of 13 people who had their car seized. 11 more were arrested for drink driving and two for antisocial behaviour. More than 100 vehicle defect notices were also issued, but organisers deny Summonat's patrons were solely responsible. I don't think police were talking about Summonat's attendees or entrance in that. It's something though that does happen around the event and like around the time of the event. But as he said, it happens all year. Oh, I understand the frustration that police have. Uh, well, they're dealing with this sort of bad behaviour on the streets of Canberra. But the event isn't likely to burn out anytime soon. <laughs> bringing $35 million in revenue to the Territory every year. It is a draw card from all over Australia to the ACT in a quiet time for the Territory. Some of Nat's organisers say while they're reviewing this year's event, they're already planning for next year. Ethan French, ABC News, Canberra. A survey by an independent online healthcare directory claims fewer than one in four of Australia's medical practices are now bulk billing all of their patients. While the federal government says it's spending billions on Medicare, doctors say more support is needed for patients struggling with cost of living pressures. Health has become an expensive business for Justine. She had to visit the doctor about a dozen times last year while getting a diagnosis for ADHD. I've spent out of pocket $2,000 in the first half of the year. At that point, she reached Medicare's safety net, which means she got a higher rebate for the rest of the year. But she's disappointed bulk billing wasn't an option and she's not alone. A healthcare website claims of the 6,000 clinics it anonymously surveyed, the number bulk billing all of their adult patients has fallen by 11 percentage points in the last year, from more than 34% in 2023 to just over 23% in 2024. In 2022-23, over 1.2 million Australians across the entire country didn't go to see a GP because of concerns surrounding costs. What day would suit you, Molly? The government says it's invested billions, tripling the incentives paid to doctors who bulk bill children, pensioners and concession card holders. But it claims change will take time after a decade of neglect of Medicare under the coalition. This is precisely why uh, we tripled the bulk billing incentive. It's precisely why we set up 58 operational Medicare urgent care clinics around Australia. The government's latest figures show 70% of all standard GP consults are bulk billed. This doctor is bulk billing slightly more than he was last year, but less than he was three years ago. And he says that's a worry for patients. They're not getting the preventative care that they need and somewhere down the track this is going to show up in adverse health outcomes and a greater burden on the rest of the system. GPs are calling on Medicare to subsidise a wider age bracket and the longer appointments needed for complex cases. Claire Moody, ABC News. Oppenheimer has dominated at the Golden Globes with five awards from eight nominations. Australian actors Elizabeth Debicki, who played Princess Diana in The Crown, and Sarah Snook, who played Shiv Roy in Succession, have each won their categories. Barbie actress and producer Margot Robbie was snubbed for an acting award, but she took home a statue, recognising the film's extraordinary success at the box office. <laughs> A Barbie, a princess and a scheming heiress. 
Three roles that earned three Australians Golden Globes. After ten nominations, Margot Robbie's Barbie won two awards. Hi Barbie. For Best Original Song and the new category of Cinematic and Box Office Achievement, it's now made $2 billion. We want to thank the brave individuals at Warners and Mattel for taking an extraordinary risk. Yes. Margot Robbie missed out on Best Musical or Comedy Actress to Emma Stone in Poor Things, but two other Aussie stars were successful. Elizabeth Debicki, who played Princess Diana in The Crown, won Best Supporting Actress in a Drama. I'm so... this is just astonishing to me. And Sarah Snook, who took home Best Actress in a Drama for her role as power-hungry Shiv Roy in hit show Succession. This show is... It, it, it's changed my life. Succession itself won four awards. Beef, which was inspired by a road rage encounter that actually happened to its creator, scooped up three statues. Uh, sir, I, I hope you honk and yell and inspire others for years to come. In the film stakes, the night belonged to Oppenheimer, with five awards including Best Drama and Best Actor for Killian Murphy. Thank you. These Golden Globes are the first since its governing body was disbanded over corruption issues and a lack of diversity. Lily Gladstone from Killers of the Flower Moon was the first Indigenous actor to be nominated and to win Best Actress. <laughs> she began her acceptance speech in the Blackfeet language. Native actors used to speak their lines in English and then the sound mixers would run them backwards to accomplish Native languages on camera. This is an historic win. It doesn't belong to just me. An award, she said, that she shared with every little native kid with a dream. Mazoe Ford, ABC News. Coming up on 7.30 with David Spears, a visit to ground zero of Japan's earthquake zone. All that's left is the walls. This is the famous Market Street with 1,000 years of history. We set the table and as soon as we sat down, bang, that was the first quake. I'm sorry to say, but people who are missing now, I think that most of them will not be saved. Also, I'll speak with Simon Baker about the new series, Boy Swallows Universe. A young Palestinian girl has been shot dead by Israeli police near a checkpoint in the occupied West Bank. Security footage shows a white car ploughing into two Israeli officers near East Jerusalem. Police then followed the vehicle, shooting a man and woman and a girl inside a van nearby. Elsewhere, Hamas health officials say more than 73 people have been killed in Gaza and seven Palestinians were killed in an Israeli drone attack in Janine. More Australian soldiers are heading to the UK where they'll train Ukrainian defence forces. As the war with Russia approaches its second anniversary, Australia has committed to expanding its support for Ukraine throughout the year. The latest deployment of 90 soldiers will train members of Ukraine's infantry and work with the nation's young leaders. While it hasn't offered everything Ukraine has asked for, it takes Australia's support for the country to around a billion dollars since Russia's invasion. Australia is one of the largest non-NATO contributors to the resistance effort in Ukraine. Already uh, we've devoted $910 million worth of expenditure, about $730 million of that is on military equipment. So we make decisions as a government based on the advice of the Australian Defence Force, working in cooperation with the Ukrainian military. Bangladesh's Prime Minister has won an historic fifth term in Parliament in an election marred by boycotts and deadly violence. The win didn't come as a surprise as the opposition accused the government of rigging the vote. The only suspense was voter turnout, which was half of what it was at the last election. Clashes between two groups, accusing each other of rigging the vote. One side supports the ruling party's candidate, the other fighting for their local independent. People in the swelling crowd say there was ballot stuffing at a nearby polling station. Police arrived pretty quickly on scene and dispersed what could have become a potentially deadly situation. But the atmosphere remains tense. Boycott! 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 
just kilometres away. More protests. Many are worried about rising fuel and food prices as the once booming economy stagnates. But they don't see any point in voting. The election was boycotted by the main opposition party, who claimed the country's institutions have been captured by the government and that the vote is unfair. The boycott almost guaranteed Sheikh Hasina another five years in power. She's been accused of running an authoritarian government, arresting almost 10,000 opposition party workers and some senior leaders in the months before the vote. Muhammad Sajjal Hussain's father was one of those workers. An outspoken critic of PM Hasina, the tea stall owner was picked up by police in late October, three days before a deadly opposition rally. And the next time Muhammad Sajjal saw his father was in hospital. My father was struggling to breathe. He was admitted into the ICU but kept on the floor. He was handcuffed and his legs were also tied. The family believes he was tortured by authorities for being an opposition party organiser. Sheikh Hasina is killing people and now again she is in power. The government insists the election was free and fair. But a low voter turnout, a crackdown on dissent and the absence of any meaningful opposition are testing the country's democracy. Meghna Bali, ABC News, Dhaka. Petrol prices remain high, but Australian drivers actually get a bargain. Daniel Ziffer explains. Fuel is one of the few products where massive illuminated signs tell you the current price as you move around. So we're very sensitive to changes in it. A litre of unleaded petrol was, on average in Australia last week, $1.85. That's down a bit on the average for the past year. The price of diesel basically tracks this graph, but at about 10 cents more per litre. Instability in the Middle East isn't helping, and the price of crude oil leapt today, but there's another element adding to the pain at the pump. Australia is one of the only developed nations without fuel efficiency standards, meaning we get dumped with the world's dirty cars. The new standard was meant to be released before Christmas, but it didn't happen. The federal government says it is taking the time to get it right. And you might not like to hear this, but we have some of the cheapest and lowest tax fuel in the world. This is a list of similar countries in the OECD. Norway drills way more oil than we do and pays more too. So in summary, we don't tax it much and we don't insist on good cars to burn it. Overseas markets gave a largely negative lead for stock traders and our share market copied the homework, falling slightly today. For many people, it was their first day back at work, but the Australian dollar is still on holiday, moving down 0 0.0002 of a cent against the American dollar. Let's call that flat. And that's finance. The Matildas Olympic hopes have suffered a major setback after captain Sam Kerr ruptured her anterior cruciate ligament at a training camp in Morocco. Kerr is unlikely to return for the Paris Olympics, which are less than seven months away. Matildas coach Tony Gustafsson has called it a devastating blow. Star striker Sam Kerr could be sidelined for up to 12 months. My, you know, heartfelt thoughts are with Sam at the moment. You know, she has had her time on the sidelines with a few injuries in her career. I no doubt know that she has what it takes to come back from this better and stronger. It's another setback for Kerr, whose Women's World Cup campaign last year was plagued by a calf injury. The 30-year-old will miss the Matildas Olympic qualifiers against Uzbekistan next month. She will have every resource, not only with Chelsea, but with Matildas to get her back onto the pitch. Kerr is one of many female footballers to rupture their ACL, with women and girls up to six times more likely to experience the injury. We know that women's football is under-resourced compared to men's. So we know that they may play on turf that's not as well kept as the, as the men's side. Um, their timetables might be more packed. So things like that that are gendered in nature, so there's different expectations put on the girls and women's game that we think could set girls and women's up for a higher risk of ACL injury. 
Kerr is the first Australian woman to be nominated for the Ballon d'Or and appear on the cover of the video game FIFA. While it will be a race against time to play at the Olympics in July, she'll remain a key part of the Matildas as they set their sights on qualification. No doubt they'll have her in and amongst the team as much as possible uh, throughout her recovery so that she can still be that mentor uh, that she was throughout the World Cup. Joe Healy, ABC News. Australia has levelled its T20 women's cricket series against India with a six-wicket victory in Mumbai. Batting first, the hosts posted eight for 130. Kim Garth, Annabelle Sutherland and Georgia Wareham each took two wickets for the tourists. In reply, Australia reached the victory target with an over to spare. Elise Perry top scored with an unbeaten 34 in her 300th international for Australia, hitting the winning runs with a six. It's kind of crept up, crept up on me a little bit um, and in the last couple of days it sort of just made me reminisce um, where it all started really in the backyard with my dad and, and my brother. I'm especially grateful that somehow starting there has miraculously turned into a career for as long as it has been. Australian Open organisers are hopeful fans haven't seen the last of Rafael Nadal after the Spanish champion pulled out of the tournament. The two-time winner suffered a minor injury while playing in Brisbane and will return to Spain to get treatment. Meanwhile, Australia's greatest hope, Alex Dimonor, says he loves proving the doubters wrong as he enjoys the best form of his career. A rain-soaked Melbourne park dampened the opening day of qualifying. But Alex Stimenor found a dry court as he tunes up ahead of his best chance at an Australian Open title. The 24-year-old has gained more fans after breaking into the top 10 for the first time. It's a pretty good thing to wake up to this morning. To get there, Dimenor boasted big United Cup wins over three top 10 players. Sometimes maligned for lacking the weapons to beat the best, he says he thrives on people's criticism. It's something that, you know, I've heard my whole career and, and it's fine. Um, uh, I love proving people wrong. Dimonor's hopes lifted overnight after Spanish great Rafael Nadal announced he's pulling out of the tournament after tearing a muscle in Brisbane. Obviously extremely sad and disappointing that he's uh, missing. While only a minor injury, it could be the final time Australian fans see the 37-year-old up close. I hope it's not the last time, but if it is the last time, I think it's you know, pretty special for those that were in the stadium and those that were able to come along all week. In Brisbane, Grigor Dimitrov enjoyed a quiet night after winning an ATP title trophy for the first time since 2017. Yeah, we just yeah, got some food, packed and... and... The 32-year-old Bulgarian snapped his title drought by beating young gun Holger Rune in the men's final. In the women's, Yelena Rabakina thrashed Arena Sabalenka to avenge last year's Australian Open final. Sabalenka won just three games in a stunning result. And Alexander Zverev has saved two match points to take Germany to a United Cup triumph over Poland in Sydney. Tom Maddox, ABC News. Time for the weather now, and tonight's viewer photo has been sent in by Marsha Russell at Marlow Lagoon. We saw some scattered showers and thunderstorms across the top end in eastern Barkley today, humid with an afternoon storm in Alice Springs. Darwin reached 34 degrees today, 36 in Jabiru. Catherine and Borroloola reached 35 degrees, hot in central Australia, 36 the top in Tennant Creek and Alice Springs, 39 at Yalara. On the satellite, you can see clouds and thunderstorms across eastern Australia with scattered thunderstorms storms across Queensland and the Northern Territory. A trough extends from central Australia across New South Wales and into Victoria. Interstate tomorrow showers along much of the east coast, a top of 30 degrees in Brisbane, 27 in Sydney, partly cloudy in Melbourne, Hobart and Adelaide, windy in a top of 31 in Perth. Back home, mostly sunny in Alice Springs, a top of 37 degrees, a chance of showers in Alicorung and Tennant Creek. Thunderstorms further north, 33 degrees in Borroloola, 32 in Catherine. And thunderstorms predicted as well in the west, a top of 32 degrees in the rural area, 31 in Darwin. The afternoon high tide will be just after 4.40pm tomorrow. The sun will rise at 6.28 and set around 7.20. And looking ahead, showers and storms predicted in Darwin for the rest of the week, bringing slightly cooler temperatures. While in Alice Springs, it's staying hot with sunshine right through the week, a few clouds over the weekend.
Stay with us now. David Spears is up next with 7.30. Have a good night.